front end automation testing with WebDriver presented by Enrique Mata. Thank you. Hi guys, um, so I'll, what I want to talk about today is uh, keeping it fat, which is uh, front-end automation testing. Um, it is one of those not really regarded parts of testing. People don't really use it much or do much about it, or if they do, uh, they don't really fully understand. They usually use either the old Selenium uh, add-on for Firefox or just good old iMacros, which is good for some stuff, but you want to expand it past just something simple. So, uh, who am I? Well, first, I'm really bad at slides. I'm not a designer, I'm just a developer like you guys, so I have no idea how to make good slides. Uh, I'm also an SDET at uh, West Point Underwriters, which is an insurance software company. Uh, I maintain the Cucumber Water WebDriver uh, stuff. Um, over there. Uh, I'm a Rubyist and a hacker by trade. Uh, I like breaking software and making sure that if it's broken, the developer knows how it broke so they can fix it. And finally, I love FOSS. Uh, when I first started uh, my journey into Linux, I was 15 years old. I saw a box of Red Hat 4.2 at some store, and I said, I gotta have it. Mm -hmm. And we spent two weeks trying to get that up and running. So, without knowing anything. What's FOSS? Uh, free open source uh, software, which, uh, as we all know, uh, means that we are able to look at the so uh, uh, source code and own it as if we need to for whatever we needed to do. We're the masters of our computers, as opposed to people who are like, just don't care and want things to run, yet they don't know what's really happening in the back end, background. So, life back. So the front-end designers and the back-end developers don't like each other much. Uh, <laughs> there's a big disconnect between the two, and we're not even including DevOps in this with its separate uh, environments. So what FAT helps us do is it helps us ensure that A, there's browser compatibility, B, that we can ensure that the UI is working and that things do work. Let's say we are creating a new business policy for an insurance company that before we run the code, we could post that new business as if we were a manual tester. And after we, we update the code, the same will happen. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's a consistent acceptability test to ensure that your, um, your changes don't affect the UI much. There are going to be changes in your, uh, in your UI, yes, that's a given. But you don't want stupid little changes like instead of TXT UID for your user ID, somebody decided to actually spell out TXT user ID and it just breaks a lot of things because you know when you post that to the back end, it's not going to know what it is. So, finally, it makes sure that your fixes don't break other things. You might be in, again, this isn't unit testing, this is just front end integration testing to make sure that when you get from point A to point B, nothing in between breaks and everything's the same as before because if you're working on one page, you don't know what's happening in the other page. And if you're working with legacy code where it doesn't have unit tests, then you run into an issue where you don't know what your left hand's doing about with its right hand or whatever. So, that is not a silver bullet. Uh, you need unit testing, you need uh, to make sure that you have the specifications, you need to code this right, and you need to attack it from both sides. What FAT will do for you, though, is it will make sure that when your manual QA testers are running scripts, that it's consistent for them. So, um, with that said, what do we use for, uh, for FAT? Well, Selenium WebDriver is one of the many, many front end tools um, that exists out there. Casper JS, Phantom JS, QTP soap test. But with Selenium, um, it is open source and free, free available. And there's a strong community behind Selenium. And there are bindings in many languages, Ruby, JavaScript, PHP, Perl, you know, whatever language you're using at that time, there probably is a binding for Selenium. So you don't have to change your whole project over to a vendor lock-in language like with uh, QTP or Silk test, you can actually use a real programming language to run these tests. Now, 
Um, I gave you the links here for the support site and Selenium source code, if you want to give it a look-see. And these slides will be available on my blog, which apparently I have one now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I really suggest that you look at the Selenium WebDriver first. Now what I'll be going through is what's called Water and Water WebDriver, uh, which is the uh, uh, AP, oh, well, let's just see what it is. It's a wrapper for the Ruby WebDriver uh, APIs. Um, but it, it makes it easier to use Selenium in Ruby as opposed to having five lines of code just so that you could click a button. It's now just one long line of code. And you'll see in just a moment what that looks like. Note, Selenium is not a load testing tool. That is very, very important. A lot of people will see this and they think, oh, well, I could spawn many, many threads and many, many browser instances and whatnot. That's not a good idea. <laughs> Use a good load testing tool like JMeter if you're going to do that. And now, there's with water, there's actually two ways of driving uh, your web automation testing. Um, the Selenium web driver, which I've already mentioned, and the second is actually the classic version, which uh, runs through the Win32 OLA drivers. It pretty much runs the IE browser only through its common object model. So if you're, if you're testing IE and you don't want any JavaScript inserted in there because you know IE loves to handle JavaScript properly, uh, I would suggest you look at the classic as opposed to web, web driver. Um, and there's also speed issues when it comes to IE uh, testing. But the nice thing about water is it is actually a meta gem which contains both the classic and the web driver. So you can call it on the spot whichever one you want. So my suggestion is, unless you're doing IE testing, stick with the web driver. Uh, there used to be a web driver for Firefox that's no longer supported. Uh, not, uh, not, I mean, a classic version for Firefox that's no longer supported. And web driver in general is just a little bit better, a little cleaner. And the best part about it is that you can take care of your Chrome testing, your Firefox testing, your headless testing. I mean, there's, if it's got a browser, it has a driver. And there's also a third-party Perl drivers, if you guys are interested in that, for uh, this. Now, these slides came from Perl Oasis, so there might be some mentions of Perl, like this one right here. So, a code example. Let us look at what, uh, what this does. So, I'm going to pull up my handy-dandy sublime text and my t terminal. Uh, cancel. Let's look at, let's first look at the source code for this. Now I'm coupling Cucumber and Gherkin with uh, water because one of the things that I've found out in my years of doing this is manual QA people, they know the business process. They understand how to get from point A to point B in your site. They know everything about your site, but they're not programmers. So how do we get them to be more comfortable with writing these automation scripts Yet, yet still utilize something as powerful as Selenium. Well, in comes Cucumber. And let me close everything out. Sorry about this, guys. Should have been more prepared. <coughs> so, these are Gherkin scripts. As you can see, plain in English, the feature, we search Google. And this is for Pearl Oasis to verify that Pearl Oasis is the first link. And then we go to a scenario of Perl Oasis. Given that I'm using Chrome and that I'm going to this website, I start my search. And I put that in there just so that it, the, the text flows a little bit better. Um, then I search the site for Perl Oasis. Then I verify the first link is Perl Oasis. Then I close my browser. And I do this with Firefox as well. Just so, and this test will show both. Mm -hmm. and let's look at the source code real quick. Mm -hmm. So. As you can see, the Gherkin script, so the page, you, the uh, view you were just looking at, is that just your um, wordy outline, mm -hmm. or is that a, a that translated into code? Yes, and I'll, show, I'll, I'll go into that in just a second. Um, the nice thing about Cucumber and Gherkin is that, as you can see right here, given that I'm using something, do, browser, and now it creates a block for us, the value of whatever that is, it gets assigned to that argument, and now we can call the browser based off whatever we put in. 
Chrome, Firefox, anything like that. What this, what Cucumber does is that it parses the scenario text and then uh, finds the proper block to push this to. In Ruby, uh, in similar to other languages, you know, this is pretty much what, you know, what Cucumber will do almost all the time. It'll find the right block, assign the value based off uh, whatever regex you put in there, and it could be more complex regex. I put something real simple, just a like grab all for whatever term. Or you don't have to, actually. You could just have a simple, then I close my browser, and the block doesn't have to take any arguments in, and then it just closes the browser, something like that. Uh, Cucumber's a little bit, it's very complex in the, in the fact that uh, <laughs> it's complex in its simplicity. It stubs out your, uh, your regex automatically, but it's up to you to massage it to what you need it to. And then finally, if you need something that's globally available like your browser um, object, you'd have to go to create a environment, that, um, no, the hooks, before and after, which actually I didn't do it in this one, um, where you put in anything that you need for your scenario before. Just your, it's your tear ups, uh, your setups and teardowns. So just like any other unit testing language out there, but it's a, it's a little weird. And there's also a world uh, option where you could create specific methods in Cucumber, or for Cucumber to, to work with. Let's just say that you have a, a certain method that if you put in the text true, you want to parse it properly and return a true or false based off of whatever you throw in, well, you would put it in your uh, world class. So anyway, let's go to, let's run this real quick and see how this looks like. In a, in a second, you'll see the browser opening up. This one is, pull up, there you go. It goes pretty fast in first verifications. And you can see we're using Firefox now. It creates its own instance, uh, its own profile for Firefox. You could create custom profiles for Firefox if you want to. Uh, but with Chrome, it, uh, I, I'm not familiar with how to do custom profiles with Chrome, but it, it still runs it regularly, I guess. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that the two scenarios passed. It went through 10 steps all together, and it took us 42 seconds, 35, uh, and 305 milliseconds to, to get to where we're going to. And as you can see, it's the actual script written out for us with what we're um, look, you know, the, the values that we're, we're parsing through. So, a better way of doing this, though, is let's uh, let's just do something live. What do you guys want me to do? Is there a site that you guys want me to go to, look through, anything of that particular? Yeah, I see a lot of enthusiastic people. Suncustlog.org? Okay, 4chan. Okay, oh, 4chan, okay, sure. 4chan, what's that? Classic. Oh, no. Well, I want to know fake FBI sites that won't let you leave without paying 300 bucks. Ah, jeez. <laughs> so, again, we're using Ruby, uh, but with... Uh, with Perl or any other languages, you could use the Selenium drivers for it. It's a little bit more complex than the water uh, portion of this, this is, but you know, the devil's in Ruby, guys. I'm sorry. Deal with it. So we want to go to what? Uh, Suncoast Log? Yeah. No, no. So let's create the browse, browser equals water, browser.new. Firefox. We throw in the symbol for Firefox so that it knows what we're going to use. And let's put this to the side while we work. <coughs> uh, 
browser.goto, suncoastlibrary.org. Okay, and is there anything you want me to click, press, play the button? video? Play the video. Oh, mm -hmm. why'd, you, why'd you have to pick that one? Yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be simple. No, because it's uh, it's not. Uh, try to get to one of the things under about, one of the links under okay. about, like about history. So let's look for mm -hmm. something with about. Now, one thing that you are going to find out is you're <coughs> going to need, where the heck is my inspector here? There we go. You're going to need to find out what the heck your clicker. So this is uh, drop down toggle, drop down href. Uh, what else can I identify here? So, okay, the text is about. So browser dot link text. Actually, I'm doing this wrong. Text. Ah, the new style. About. I know. I gotta get used to it. Dot present. Let's see if it's there first. And it is. Present allows us to do two things. First, it allows us to check if it exists. And then it allows us to check if it's visible. They're separate exist and they're separate visible, but using present is very handy uh, to, so that you don't have to type two commands out. So, um, so it's present. Let's click it. Actually, let's flash it first. Uh, yeah, I'm going to flash it better than this one. So, why? <laughs> it's responsive. I hate it. There we go. Okay. Let's flash this bad boy. Just to make sure that we're grabbing. Oh, see, we verified that uh, we're getting the right um, web element. And then finally, we're going to click. Now, that didn't do much. Oh, it did. But it's, well, what's this, another look, treasury? Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's click on treasury next. Can you click on it without seeing would be the thing? Yeah. I don't see a thought process oh. using the YouTube no cookie. In, okay. in, in quotes. Yeah. Oh, I did it. There, I, I messed up there. Let's start again. All right. Oh, sure. There. Mm. Oh my God. Mm. Mm. Uh, <coughs> and now we're clicking treasury. Um. There you go. Um, what this little demo is, is just so you know that you don't have to use Cucumber. You can use whatever you want, straight programming scripts, loop through whatever you need to. And hell, let's look at all the available uh, browser.links. Now each link. Link.txt. And, okay, so that's Valerie. Well, even though I wasn't successfully able to get all the text, uh, what you can see is that they grabbed all the available links within the web page. So you could loop through them and click on them if you want to verify that they exist. If you have a list of already known links that you want to verify that are still there, that's one way you can go through it. So. Would you put parentheses after href instead of dot text? What about inspect? Like that? Yeah. Does uh, each actually return? A, is each actually a map? I thought it was just used for its side effects. No, each uh, each is uh, how we um, loop through the enumeration of. Yeah, but I didn't know its return value was in was used. Yeah, it is. Okay, so it's like map then. Yeah, it's map. Do you want to try a two a uh, two s? Uh, to us, isn't really kind of or, or inspect. Yes. 
Try and spec on it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, it's still kind of weird. All right, change. Why don't you change that until nil, just so we can see that it's just so it's returning nothing, and we can see that it should be a list of nothing. No, no, not 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 nil. Just the entire thing, so it's just so that nothing is going on inside the each. No, no, not puts just just nil. No. Yeah, I, whatever that each is doing, this way the way other eaches might work, that each is not returning the value of your last expression. That is weird. Yeah. How about this? Is there a map? I could do that. I, I'll do something a little different. There's that each. Mm. Let's see. Oh, I know why. Jeez. It's because I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a clever man, guys. <laughs> There we go. Oh, so it's okay, but so the return value of each. I forgot isn't to print it out. That's why. So the return value of each is each is not actually a map then. Yeah. Okay. My mistake. So it prints it out. My mistake. Uh, my mistake on that. Right, but so it looks through and gives you the objects of every link available. So. So that is just my short little demo of water itself. Oh. So let's go back to the slide. Can that replace like everything that Selenium would do? Actually, it, it again. Uh, what Water does is it is just an API wrapper for Selenium for to make Selenium easier to use. Oh, okay. I, I came in late. Uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's uh, instead of writing something that's three, four lines long for Selenium to find the right uh, element and putting the right value in there, it's just one line of code instead, and it's it doesn't use XPath at all for it. So. All right, so back to this, and so I want to talk about some uh, experiences and pitfalls I've found at West Point. Because if you want to create a tool that your manual QAs are going to use, um, they, it, you, you're going to run into some weird things. First is you got to know what you want to implement, know what decisions to make. It's very important to know that. Um, if you're a Perl shop, why are you doing Ruby for your automation testing? Or if you're a Node.js shop, why are you doing Perl for your uh, Selenium? Try to stick with the, the language of the shop. Now, with that said, there are some limitations to that. Um, for example, .NET is not a very friendly language, if any of you know, so you can't really find any and I know there probably exists something that's similar to Cucumber, but uh, originally when I decided to use Ruby at a .NET shop, it was the name of the